Yeah, hello everyone. This is our next hit of Inside the 22 World Rugby's look at the biggest names in the game. It is the Hall of Fame week brought to you by Tudor. The World Rugby Hall of Fame is how we are rolling through uh, our next little instalment. And it is a very, very great pleasure for me to bring in a guy that I've been lucky enough to work alongside, watch for a number of years. I'm talking about a man who has captain the Wallabies, won a World Cup, done all sorts of stuff. We're going to climb into that right now. George Gregan, good evening. It is so nice to see your smiling face. Good evening, Sean. Good to see you as well in, in, in good spirits as well. <laughs> Can you be a little bit more excited about having a chat with me? I know that you are. <laughs> well, I am actually. I actually saw some footage of us doing something about food. Going on about five or oh, a long time ago, maybe two years ago in, in Africa, which brought a smile to my face. Out of Zambia, it was called. So that uh, that, was, that yeah. brought a big smile to my face in preparation for our chat tonight. Uh, it was. It was a terrific time uh, looking after the kids of Livingston in Zambia. Where do we want to start with this, Grease? I mean, there is so much that we can tick off as part of this Hall of Fame week with the World Rugby Podcast. Maybe let's spin it back to 2013 when you were actually mm. inducted into the Hall of Fame. How did that come about and who did you go in alongside? Yeah, I remember the, the first of getting notified by World Rugby that I was inducted, which was just a huge honour. Um, and it uh, was something which I wasn't expecting uh, and it was pretty amazing actually um, to receive that sort of, you think of your career and when you're, in it, when you're actually performing and and, and, and playing games and, and playing internationals, you, you just you caught up in that moment, and then it's on to you reflect, and then uh, obviously someone puts forward your name, and you get that call. It's a, it really gives you a chance to take breath and reflect on your career. So to go to Dublin, it was in Dublin. Um, I think it was around. They had a big conference, and it culminated in um, there was a, a an award, and there's the induction of of Hall of Famers, which I was that year. I believe uh, it was also. Gosh, it's probably two years out from the Rugby World Cup. So I remember being at this event with Richie McCaw um, and the All Blacks were playing, uh, I think, the, the Irish that weekend. There was going to be some game. And I think uh, that was the one where the All Blacks, I think, won in the 82nd minute. They scored right after the death. And um, mm. Johnny Sexton and, and the team had, had pushed them to the absolute limit at Aviva Park. So it was a pretty special week. And um, that's what I recall. And it was, yeah, it was a really humbling experience because you got a chance to reflect on your, your, your path to get into the into firstly the Wallaby team playing to nationals for a long period of time with coaches players who helped you get there and uh, it, was, it was a really special evening and of course it's in it's in Ireland it's in Dublin you have a few you have a few Guinness to uh, commemorate the occasion <laughs> I'm having a look at some of the other Wallabies that were inducted in that same year alongside you David Campisi Ken Catchpole Mark Eller uh, Tommy Lawton as well they're obviously great to the game because they are World Rugby Hall of Famers. You join them in that uh, in that reckoning. Who were some of the guys that you grew up idolising and looking at in much the same way many others would have looked at you through your playing days? Yeah, and when it comes to rugby union, my first real taste of rugby union came when I went to well, my, my primary school in Canberra called St Edmunds. And they, prior to that, I played rugby league. So obviously I looked looked up to and, and was supporting a lot of rugby league teams, which had an eye, had an eye and, and, and an interest in rugby union. And probably the 1984 Grand Slam was the thing which really I recall in terms of rugby. We had a strong first 15 at our school. There was a guy called Ricky Stewart, was a pretty handy player. But in 1984, mm. the Wallabies went away on the Grand Slam tour. We used to watch that on our local uh, free-to-air t- uh, television network called ABC. And watching them go through that tour undefeated and win, win the Grand Slam, Mark Heller, a young Nick Far Jones, a young Michael Liner, some wonderful players, Steve Tymon, um, was just to name a few, uh, incredible players who had a wonderful career with the with the Wallabies. But that, that's when you look at it and you go, "Wow, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to be able to represent your country wearing that uh, incredible historical jersey, which is the Wallaby jersey, and uh, and do something special with a group of." Group of your mates, which is what really resonated with that 1984 Grand Slam, which was coached obviously by Alan Jones, and um, you know it was a, it was a really special moment in Australian rugby. So 1984 is kind of the benchmark for you going through. That's kind of your kick point. You see a lot of idols there and that type of thing. Which tour or which run of events was kind of your moment where you felt like your teammates and yourself had emulated? some of what that 1984 team had done in terms of, 
achievements. Yeah, that 84, gosh, that's that's a pretty special team, isn't it? That's a pretty special um, accomplishment. I don't think there's been a, a, or there has been a Grand Slam tour. I think Bobby Dean took his team, was it 2010? They had the Grand Slam mm -hmm. tour, but they weren't able to win all the test matches. This just shows you how difficult it was. I remember going in 1996, it was the first professional tour the Wallabies went on, once rugby went from amateur to professional. That was an undefeated tour. We played midweek games, we played test matches. I think we played everyone but England, so it wasn't a Grand Slam tour. So that was the closest. Um, but there's a number of players um, play playing over the course of that sort of six-week tour. Uh, so that, that, was, that was a pretty good accomplishment too. But to me, I think uh, to put it in, to compare it, to be fair, would probably be the World Cup for us in 1999. That's when you realise you've gone into, uh, you know, uh, pretty special a pretty special uh, part of rugby history when you do something like that. And we were undefeated, so we, we sort of took a leaf out of their book, but it was a World Cup, um, which is pretty special. But uh, no, I would love to have played at, at Grand Slam, actually. There's a lot of things that uh, you look back on, you have no regrets. Not that I have any regrets about it, it just didn't work out. It would have been great to have done a Grand mm. Slam tour, to have played all those uh, traditional rugby nations in their neck of the woods. Going back to the World Cup, what's your overriding memory of 99, of that campaign? What jumps out at you more than anything else across that eight-week period over in the UK? The 99 campaign, you, there's a few things which jump out. Like, we just enjoyed ourselves. We enjoyed the experience. We're based in Ireland for the first probably month, which was great for our pool stages. We were in Port Marnock about 25, 30 minutes ahead of uh, Dublin. Uh, we were staying um, in an old manor. Um, which was called, um, oh, which was which was just ideal. And and down the road for the golfers of us, there was the old Port Marnock. We were staying <laughs> on a golf course, so that was good to get off. Uh, but we started the tour with a lot of fun. Like it was it was it was relaxed. Um, we knew we were there to do business. But the, the what I think probably the, which stands out most to me with that group is the ability to really switch on and be really focused. But then when we didn't have to. We just enjoyed each other's company and there's lots of that. We'd go out in groups of six, seven people, six to eight, um, and, and enjoy and become locals like we were. And it just felt like we were on tour having a great time, but when it was time to lock in for training and then going into big games, and probably the first um, real test for us was playing Ireland in Dublin at obviously Lansdowne Road in 1999. And they're the sort of games that if you're going to be serious in, in, in the World Cup, you had to be able to deal with and and and... and and cope with it and then execute really well under pressure. And the team went through that game. And I think that was probably the start of it, uh, of that group really believing, hang on, we can, we can potentially get this done because we had a really big, good, big match temperament, but also a really good ability, as I said, to switch on and off. It was a really enjoyable tour. Like we, there was lots of laughter. Um, there was, there, there was lots of enjoyment within the group. But as I said, you gotta, you gotta balance it out with being serious. And, um, we did that really well in 1999. So it started nice and loose, and then it culminates kind of with the tournament-defining try scored by uh, the Melon, Owen Finnegan. He has dined out on this time and time again with me, with our afternoon speaking, that kind of thing. He can recall it millimetre perfect over and over again. What are your memories of your pass to Owen Finnegan to set him off towards the line against France to eventually win the William Webb Ellis? Yeah, I remember it was a play we'd been using, like not just for the World Cup campaign, we'd been using it for a couple of years, that play. And obviously he was like the super sub. He'd come on with maybe 25, 30 minutes, like they call them the finishers now. So he'd come off and do that from the bench. He had a really important role to play, like everyone did in the squad. But uh, his was definitely that and then provide an impact and, and keep his discipline, which he didn't do the week before. Hence, we played an extra 20 minutes against South Africa <laughs> when we had to go into an extra time because of him. We let him know. We still let him know that we didn't have to play that extra 20 minutes if he just had some discipline. But anyway, he gets the last laugh. But it's the sort of thing. And Owen was a very intelligent footballer. Like, he, he, he de definitely his head looks like a rugby player. Definitely, that's why he's called the melons, about the size of two Gilberts. <laughs> and, uh, but he's very intelligent and he, he liked that play. So he's coming on and he's sort of saying, Griggs, let's try to make the six man course. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. So I'm like, you've been at it for two minutes. We're going to get to your play. <laughs> so it sets up nicely. We've been building, we've been going off the top. Anyway, we call that play and he ran that line well. And of course he ran that line well because it was, it was, it was a perfect line for him. And we'd run those sorts of plays for him for many, many years. So there's a nice, there's a nice sort of, um, I guess, uh, combination between he and I and he, the rest is history. He probably shouldn't have only ran 
he should have run over the little halfback that he sort of got out of his way, he didn't even attempt to tackle him. And then everyone else sort of ran as though he, he must have stunk or something. But he ran about 40 odd <laughs> metres further than he should have. <laughs> as you said, he's been dining out on that try ever since. But it was a moment, it's funny, even me talking about it in a, in a joking kind of way now, when he actually got over the line and that try was awarded, that's when he actually took a breath as a team. We didn't take a breath, he just, everyone was really excited because you knew then, like, we're going to be world champions. We, we, we can't lose it from here. We're going, to, we're going to win this game. And that was, yeah, that was pretty special. And, uh, you know, and of course, Owen, Owen was the try scorer. <laughs> that remains my favourite moment, I think, uh, in in the history of the Wallabies, having had seen that as a 19-year-old. What are, what's the most asked about moment that punters question of you across your 136 test uh, oh. history? What's the number one moment that you... The number one well, moment? There's a I couple. I thought there might be a I've couple probably been asked one. No, it's a good point. Good. That's a good... No, but I actually, I think I've only ever made one tackle in my career. <laughs> really, <laughs> I, I played that many test matches around life. I was I'm known for one tackle. I was, it's like a, I use the analogy. I love my golf. Gene Sarazen, he was a great, great uh, Grand Slam champion. Uh, he won Masters. He won U.S. Opens. He won British Opens. Um, slam, little Gene Sarazen, and uh, he was. He they asked him the question. He says, "I only get rem remembered for one shot at Augusta. I think he hit his forward turf rider over the 15th hole." Part five and made a double eagle on Albatross. And everyone talks about that every time. Even now, they still talk about the great Gene Sarazen. But he won a lot of tournaments. He just didn't hit that one shot. He hit a lot of great shots. <laughs> but I, I, get, I think I get, I get the tackle in the corner, Jeff Wilson, 1994. And that stadium only holds 40-odd thousand. Oh, well, it's knocked down now. But it only, at its peak, uh, mm. it held maybe 42,000 people when it was absolutely packed to the rafters. And I swear I've spoken to maybe 80,000 people who sat in that corner where I made the tackle. So <laughs> I think that's probably the question in the moment I get asked about the most. Nothing else, really. I know that uh, I know that you and a number of those guys that used to play against are all quite tight now. You catch up around the world, around World Cups and Bledisloe's and that kind of thing. Is Has there ever been a moment where you and Jeff have been in the same bar together or a restaurant or on a golf course and someone's fronted and seen the two of you in the same place and said, Ah, uh, look at this. It has happened a few times. Like we did a lunch years ago, it was a corporate lunch, but that was more people were coming up to hear about it. It was twenty year anniversary of it. I don't think we'll do it. <laughs> I said we'll do it once or only, mate. <laughs> and because uh, he copped the bath, but he's a really good sport about it. Um he, he should have never been in that position. He probably he sidestepped about six of our defenders. I shouldn't have had to make the tackle. I shouldn't be talking to you about it, Shawnee, to be fair. If everyone else has done their job, <laughs> I kinda of joke about that. But we, we like to play golf. He's a really good golfer, a handy golfer, and so when we met each other around the world, beating New Zealand, Australia, and then even parts of during that Rugby World Cup in 2015. We take our sticks and yeah, people do do remember it. And it, it's nice, but it's a long time ago. It's a bit of it's a bit of history um, between us. And, and as I said to many people, I said, look, it doesn't come just down to that one game or that one moment. There's plenty of great experiences we had against each other. And more often than not, I was on the wrong side of the ledger when we played the All Blacks during that period. They're, they're an amazing team. Like they've been an amazing te team for the past decade, but Historically, they've always been like the team which, um, you know, you gauge where you're at. And that was no different in 96, 97. Like we started our careers at the same time. So we've got that history together. But yeah, more often than not, it's on the golf course. And people say, you guys like you play against each other and you, you play with each other. We often do pair up actually to try and beat Marshy and whoever he's playing with, Marshy and Cullen. More often than not, with Cullen, you're normally, you're normally handing over the money when you play against Cullen. He's too good. <laughs> I'll get to the golf in just a second because I want to spin it back to the afternoon that you spent in Japan last year with some of the world's best golfers and uh, world's best rugby players. Mm -hmm. Across that career against New Zealand, so 13 years in Wallaby Colours against the All Blacks, is there any one game outside of that moment that you had in 94 at the SFS that stands out above the rest? Yeah, they're always the thing about those All Black games. They're always fast and furious. That's the first thing I remember from the first one. David Wilson, Jason Little, uh, the David Campeses, the like. Uh, they all said, you know, this this these games are based on instinct. Like really, just trust your instincts because everything happens so much faster. And it was the best advice I ever got. So you don't have too much time to overthink it. You've really got to trust yourself and back yourselves and your your and your teammates around you. And that was no different. But. Um, and that never, that never changed from 1994 to when I played my last one against them in 2007. 
but probably the test match which really stands out to me. Unfortunately, we lost it at the last play of the game. Jonah scored in the tr in the corner, but it was mm. probably the best test match I played in my whole life, in my career rather, and my whole life. It was um, 2000 at Sydney Olympic Stadium. It was just prior to obviously Kathy Freeman doing her thing a few months later and winning gold medal, running around the track in the 400 metre women's final. Um, I think we played in about 109,000. It was just an incredible atmosphere and both teams turned up and the way the game was being um, interpreted and, and played, uh, particularly between those two countries, yeah, it was just an amazing game. I think it was like 37, 34, something like that. And at half time, it was 24 all, but after about nine minutes, I think the Wallaby team was down 24 nil. We found our, we fought our way back to get back to all square at half time, which is a hallmark of that team. We just, we just, we played 80 plus minutes. And then, it, yeah, we just, we just came up play short. Uh, we were leading with the, with the last play of the game and they, they were too good. So that, that still rings out. It's probably the best All Blacks test match I played in. Played some humdingers, but that one really stands out, even though we, we didn't get the, we didn't get the chocolates at the end of that night. Yeah, no, hell of a game. I want to spin it back now to, as I said, to last year. I've spoken to Brian Habana a lot about this, and I'm talking about the golf afternoon that had four yeah. ex-players, top-line rugby players, partnered with four of the world's best golfers, and he tells the story very well. So I want to get you into it because I know you love your golf. What can you tell me? about how it all unfolded last year when you're in there with Tiger and Rory and the rest of the game. Yeah, well, it was amazing, it wasn't it? It was the Zozo Championship. It was just after the quarterfinal weekend. So obviously Australia got knocked out by England. So Tins was on a high. Uh, Brian Habana was on a high. We, we were licking our wounds and uh, <laughs> and so was Drico. So half, half of the four ball were, were, were sort of just there. But like we were all on cloud nine because like we're there for the golf and we just golf tragics and the chance to play it was a par three the seventh hole um and it was with i played with jason day uh tins played with tiger um uh, rory obviously played with Drico, and then you had uh hideki matsuyama played with uh with brian and we got to all hit hit off and there was best ball so you know brian, but they all hit good shots I, I didn't hit a good shot i missed the green by about 50 meters I was that amped. I probably could have hit a wedge. I was that. I was that pumped. <laughs> <laughs> and it just smashed. I it. think Habs hit a four iron. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, Jay Day said, so, "Oh, you can press that." I said, "Yeah, maybe I did." I said, "But it went nowhere near the target, mate. It went nowhere near the target." Um, but we, I said, "But let's get up there. Your ball's close, and we just had a bit of a roll. And we rolled some putts, but more often, forget about the result. The, the chance of meeting them it was a real build up. And the funny thing is, I, I've met. I hadn't met Hideki Matsuyama before." I obviously met Jason Day. I've met Jason Day in Australia, going back to the PGA, but also met him in, in Congressional 2011 when he was was just starting, like becoming Jason Day, the international legend that he is. And I've met Rory. I watched Rory play 2011 um, when he won his first U US Open at Congressional in Washington. And I and obviously watched Tiger at the Masters in 2010. And so I've actually met those guys before. I've been lucky enough to meet them. And they're just great guys. Golfers are great guys. And the funny thing is, and well, it's a bit of a long story. I'd, I'd met Tiger at Pebble Beach because I was good mates with Michael Campbell and Campbell got me to be his caddy, not his caddy, his trainer for the week. So I was his trainer for the right. week <laughs> at Pebble Beach. And then we'd missed each other at the Masters because I'd gone to the Masters that year. I'd ticked off all my sort of bucket list through through Cambo mm. in 2010. Thank you, Cambo. Still love you to, the, to this day. And Steve Williams saw me at the Masters, but that was Tiger's first tournament back and he had all this security. So I didn't get to meet him. I'd, met, I'd seen Scotty before and he was in the green and coming up to these people, dropping all these names. Like I said, but it's true. I am a golf tragic. And then Steve Williams comes up to me at that airport in 2010 and says, hey, mate, you missed Tiger. You can't wait to meet you. You're going you're to be at the US Open. I said, yeah, I probably will be. So fast forward to the US Open. We're on the range. And then Steve Williams waves me over and and I come over because I was, you know, I was doing, I think I was stretching Cambo at that stage. <laughs> and, yeah. and then he says, he says, he says, Tigger, turn around, turn around. And then Tiger turns around and the Tiger's hitting these beautiful eight irons to within about, you know, a carpet length of the hole. Like it's it unbelievable. And um, I'm saying, wow, look at this. It's just it's, seeing them hit the ball live is amazing. That's what was amazing about that day. 
and he's hitting it and then he turns around he's got the big glowing teeth and obviously steve williams a proud new zealander loves his all blacks probably been feeding him the new zealand all black propaganda he turns around he goes oh great to meet you i've heard of the, the you know the world champion trash talk in world rugby i looked around at him i said have you been listening to this goddamn kiwi i said are you serious i said don't be listening to what he has to say I said, that's so untrue. I said, he's just a bit sour sometimes when they lose. They don't always win, Tigger. I know you'd like to think you always win. You know, sometimes you lose. We had a bit of a laugh, and that all started off the banter. And I said, oh, well, mate, I, I missed you in the Masters. I said, I, and I didn't see you on the Sunday. I said, I, I hope you're going to turn up and be in contention this weekend. And I said, because I'm here, obviously, back in my man, Canberra. I said, but I want you to be in the mix. He says, I'll be in the mix. And then we turned around, and he remembered. So you fast forward to Japan. And he comes over, hey, George, how are you doing? And he remembers just about everything from the conversations. And he's a really, uh, he's, he's just a, like, as I said, all the golfers are no different to Rory because I'd met Rory in Abu Dhabi. I'd met him, I'd met him and he obviously followed him when he beat Scotty at the, uh, the 2013 Australian Open. And just really, it was an amazing day to be with those guys. And we we're all on a buzz, you know. I remember seeing Dorse, uh, Grayson was there. You had Smitty. You had all the, all the rugby blokes who loved their golf just watching inside the ropes and just being with the guys, having having an afternoon of just uh, you know, pinching yourself. It was a pretty special day. I'm glad you recap that story around Tiger because uh, that's what Hab said. He said when, <laughs> when Tiger came up, he made a beeline straight for you and everyone else kind of like parted and Habana was like, okay, all right, so this is how it's going to be. Is it George and Tiger, mates, from going way back. So I'm glad that you've managed to put some uh, some clarity around it. Hey, what we normally do with the World Rugby Inside the 22 Chats is I kind of round it out with a couple of quick fire questions at the back end that aren't necessarily just rugby. So we're going to stay with golf, George Gregan, and I'm going to ask you this question. What's one golf course all golfers or tragics should try try and play or put at the top of their bucket list. I've never done it, but I think you've got to play the the, the Royal and Ancient. You've got to play St Andrews. That's that's the home of golf. I think that's something you've just got to do. You've got to tick that off. Okay, that's an easy one. That's an easy jump shot over to Scotland when the flights are up and running again. You get one rugby do over, good or bad. So you get to take a mulligan on one of your rugby moments, good or bad. What would it be? <laughs> I'd probably go back to a test match. It seems quite silly. 2005, I ran out, I think, against Tana's all black team in Eden Park, and I forgot all the things. I didn't have my jersey on. So we take, take off the tracksuit. I, I still hadn't put. So I said, sorry, T, I've just got to go and put my jersey on. Can you just wait a minute? <laughs> After they've done the hucker. So that would look a mulligan on that. I'd like to have had my jersey. Yeah, okay, got <laughs> All right, got that. 2005, that's a good one. I like that. Uh, who did you used to lock eyes with in the harker across your career against the All Blacks? Um, I try and spread across. You obviously touch base with Marshy every once in a while because we'd be, seeing, we'd be playing against. You always just... T touch base with the opposite. You acknowledge, I try, I try and go across the whole team, to be fair. Um, there was no one, I know there's all these stories about Mertz and everything, but one which really does stand out, it's not Mertz, so Mertz will thank me for this, it was actually Christian Cullen, it was 99, and it was the first blackout at Eden Park. And we'd heard all the feedback from the players who put this new variation on their all-black harker in 99, and, and they were going to unveil it for the blackout. So they're doing it, but obviously Cully must, Cully, I know Cully likes his sleep, so Cully must have maybe slept in or uh, <laughs> bypassed some of the rehearsals because they're in the Kamate Kamate and he's sort of doing the quarter quarter I'm, uh, and he, he's out of sync. And then it's quite obvious he's out of sync and I'm looking at him going, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then he sort of, he, he obviously knows I'm looking at him. And as we always did, we'd catch up, win, lose or draw, we'd catch up afterwards. And I said to him, I said, mate, like, seriously, <laughs> what was that effort? And he says, I don't need to cop anything from you. I've copped it from my team. We had a win on the look. That's all that counts. He says, stop looking at me when I do the harker. <laughs> <laughs> and you still get to go at each other on the golf course around it as well. Uh, these, there's two to run for you, Greece. The next one is, I know you're a really talented cricketer on the way through. Who's one bowler, alive or dead, that you would love to have faced? Oh gosh, I was lucky enough to face uh, Glenn McGraw for a couple of paces indoors. That we had an indoor, we had a little cross promotion in two thousand and five, which is pretty good. Um, but I loved the, that great West Indian team. Like you had your Joel Garners, you had you know Michael Holdings. I'd love to face Malcolm Marshall. 
just oh, like I'd, I would have liked him to to pitch it up. Don't want he bowled some incredible bounces. To make sure it was a half volley. I just love to face Malcolm Marshall. To me, he was just he just epitomised what a West Indian fast bowler was. He looked uber cool. He had the chain on. He had the bracelets, and he just came in and bowled a million miles an hour. And then just took his hat and just walked back to fine leg and it's like he was just you know <laughs> going to get back in the hammock and have a have a karuba rama like it. I would like to face Malcolm Maxwell. I'm oh, not Malcolm Maxwell. Malcolm Marshall. Malcolm, Malcolm Marshall. I got you. And last one to uh, to round out our inside the twenty two World Rugby Vodcast podcast. George Gregan, the grandkids a few years from now are playing up and you get to punish them with one George Gregan highlight on loop. On repeat for a whole day. Which one would you choose? <laughs> Which one would I choose? Um, it might be you've you've done some nice little uh, some banter about respect because I think you want to teach the kids respect. Just me not respecting or, or, or having a being being a little bit agitated towards my lovely friend Andre Watson. What a great referee! What a great man, old Andre Watson was. We had some run-ins. But I'd like that one where he tells me and, I, and he's pointing at me and I, and I, and I say, whoa, 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 don't point at me. And I'm saying you've got to respect the officials. <laughs> that would be it. Respect the officials. So there's that point. Respect the officials, kids. Grandkids, you've got to respect the officials. Don't do what your grandfather did with Andre Watson. You must respect the officials. <laughs> Didn't you then ping him with a ball not long after that over in Wellington at some no, stage? His so. memory gets That's me right. Circumstantial no, no, evidence. I think a lot of halfbacks. <laughs> referees and that, it's the whole thing in position. They do very well these days. But I think it was all that whole amateur, mo like just passing lanes. And, and Steve used to play really flat. So I used to put it out in front and sometimes the rest got in the passing lane. Paul Holmes was another one who got sometimes found him way in the passing lane. <laughs> they learned pretty quickly oh, not to good. get in there. Too good. Um, Greg, that's it. That's you done and dusted on uh, World Rugby's Inside the 22 podcast. As I said, it is World Rugby Hall of Fame week, thanks to Tudor. And thanks to you, Greg, for giving us a little bit of your time. It is terrific to see your smiling face and hear your voice again. Good on you, Shawnee. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure to be on the show. Take it easy. Take it easy, mate.